Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames have their first four-game win streak of the season, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to recap the week with you. Matt, uh, this Flames team is at least going to go down trying if they don't make the playoffs. With everything being up and down all season, you know, they got themselves in a bad spot. Um, They were eight points back of a playoff spot not that long ago, and now they're within two. Uh, they play the Chicago Blackhawks next um, and before we face the Winnipeg Jets. So, you know, we could be heading into April 5th tied with the Jets. And, you know, they are at least setting themselves up for a chance to actually make the postseason. Before we talk about what's coming, let's talk about the week that was. The Calgary Flames on March 28th played against the L.A. Kings. Uh, this was in Calgary. The week before, L.A. beat the Flames 8-2, to two, so I wasn't sure what to expect in this one, and we got a 2-1 to one win for the Flames here at the Dome. Uh, Markstrom made 33 saves for the Flames, and that was uh, th- their second win in a row. Yeah, this was a game where Calgary needed to find a way to shut the Kings down. Um, and... Uh, Thankfully, on this day, the the Jets also lost to the San Jose Sharks, which trimmed the lead down to four points at the time, um, and it, it or to two points, I should say. And Calgary just played an excellent game throughout the. They got an early goal from Manjapane, who is starting to heat up, and the Kings tied it, and Walker Dewar responded. Uh, with a nice uh, shot behind the net uh, by Trevor Lewis that was more of a pass than a shot attempt that landed on his stick before Corpusalo could reset himself. And It's kind of funny that all the scoring was in the first period of this game. Yeah, well, uh, the Flames did an excellent job of playing Daryl Sutter hockey, and they just shut the Kings down. Uh, Markstrom was full marks on this one, and he did everything he needed to do to get the two points. I still wonder how that goal in the second period was deemed a no goal in this one. That seemed like very obviously it should have been a goal. Uh, yeah, same with the uh, empty net goal uh, where Lindholm was actually onside when the puck went in, but the linesman had waved it off. Like that, There should be a replay for that instance where the linesman blows the play dead because, you know, like that... Basically, the Flames had three goals taken back in this game, two of which were legit goals. They had goals. more goals taken back than they actually got credited for. Yeah, like, and that's where like the, the score in this one's a little deceptive. Like, Yeah, the Flames won 2-1, to one, but uh, they pretty much dominated the play and were able to relegate the Kings uh, to very few uh, chances despite 33 uh, saves for Markstrom. And... They got the two points, which was at what they absolutely needed. And then they rolled ahead. They had a couple of days off and made a quick road trip up to Vancouver on Friday to take on the Canucks. This was a 5-4 Flames win in overtime. As much as we don't want to be giving up points now, the Canucks are nowhere near a playoff spot. So if we're going to drop a point, we might as well drop it to them. Yeah, this was a back-and-forth game. Uh, the Flames went down 2 nothing and were looking... Not bad, but just, you know, shades of earlier in the year when Markstrom would give up early goals and, you know, put the Flames behind the eight ball. And the Flames. That's what I was worried about here. I thought, ah, oh, crap. Markstrom gave up the early Connor Garland goal. This one might be done early. Yeah. And the Flames battled all the way back to tie it. Then, like, three minutes later, they get another one. And then we battle back and tie it again. And then, like, immediately give up the. the fourth goal uh, or the yeah the fourth goal and it was just you know it, so deflating because you know you managed to tie it twice in the span of like six minutes and each time the lead is just coughed right back up and that's not to blame marks from on any of those goals because you know like there's not a goalie that would have stopped either the mcdonough or the bovillier shots you know it, it, those were legit goals it's just you know tough that the defense allowed those chances and thankfully Jonathan Huberdeau late tied it on the power play 
And holy moly, that was a goal by Tofoli in the overtime. Yeah, it seems like Tyler Tofoli's are like, all right, boys, strap in. I'm taking you to the playoffs. Yep. Well, he's doing everything that he can. He got a pair in this one. Uh, broke his career high. He now has 33 on the season. And, uh, you know, he got the Flames the extra point, which with uh, the the Jets winning on this day, uh, that helped keep them within two points. And, you know. Francis Troy Stetcher, too. He got two points in this one. He's looked a lot better as a Flame than I expect him to, and we got him at the deadline. I, I've liked Troy Stetcher even when he was with Vancouver, so I'm thrilled. I've liked him, but I just, maybe not as much as you, but I just didn't expect him to be this much of an impact guy for a team that hasn't been making an impact. Well, he's been basically the missing link that the Flames have had with Shillington not playing this year. Um, having Stetcher play a very similar style to Shillington, uh, he's stepped right in and he, him being a veteran player, he knows where he needs to do to generate offense. And, you know, he has three goals on the season with us all with Calgary. So, you know, everything seems to be going right for him, uh, thus far. Yep, for sure. And uh, he almost got a goal in the Ducks game as well. Didn't get credited with it officially. But the last game of the week that we'll talk about just happened as we record on Sunday. Another 5-4 result, this time in regular time. And the this game, the Vancouver game and the Anaheim game, are the first times this season the Flames have won after trailing going into the third. Like, it took them 76 games to figure out how to, how to win when they're down going into the third. And I just have to say, what... The heck was that by Leo Cheech and Stone in the third period? Whoa, well, those shots were just awesome. Like, I am shocked that those two guys rifled it that good. Well, and, you know, I mean, this is very Michael Stone, though, right? He's been out for 21 games hurt. He comes back and he scores a goal. Like, we've talked a lot about Michael Stone in the past and just how good he always seems to be. And he seems to be the old, and I think that's why he's been a flame for so long. No matter how long he's out, he can step back in an NHL role. Oh, for sure. And uh, more credit to Tyler Toffoli with a pair of assists in this game. Uh, uh, now with 38 on the season. And it, it was uh, everybody all for one in this game. You had uh, the weirdest five uh, players scoring goals. Manjapane, Zadorov, Nick Ritchie. Milan Lucic and Michael Stone and you know sometimes you need your depth guys to chip in and they did in a big way in this one for sure yeah no it's I mean it's good to see Lucic out there scoring um you know Coleman and Weger assisted him I thought Coleman's been having a good year Richie another guy sort of like Stetcher who I've liked for a while and I didn't know how much of an impact he'd make but he's looked good as a flame as well yep and you know, it just a yeoman's effort from everybody. Like the Flames went down two nothing and were lifeless after the first period. Swap goaltenders. Yeah, and Eat Bread scored uh, thirty three seconds in to get the Flames some life. The Flames scored two quick ones to take the lead, cough it back up. Similar refrain to the Vancouver game, and then in the third period, just rolled all over Anaheim. And you know, they they said we want this. We're taking it. It's ours and did everything they needed to do to get the two points. And I think that's, you know, maybe a good thing to discuss here before we get to the weekly recap. Like in this game, I think, and even the Vancouver game, you finally saw this team looking like a team that wants it. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, they were down and they came out and they played a very different third in this Anaheim game. And I think if this, if these guys can continue to, be able to come in and show they want it like that. I think that they could ha- they could have some postseason uh, play in them. Well, and you saw the look on Nikita Zadorov's face when he rifled his goal in. Like he was absolutely pumped, and like the whole team was like just like yes, we got the the tying goal, and like er- you know just the enthusiasm that the all the players on the team are showing that like the team itself is buying in and like, let's go. And we have this within our graphs. Let's just go and get it. And you know, the, they're within two points and our next opponents, the Chicago Blackhawks who are the worst team in the NHL. So the flames have a perfect opportunity heading into the Anaheim or the Winnipeg game on April 5th. 
um, to be tied with them, with the Jets having a game in hand and the Flames, you know, they will need to win that game. But they're at least setting the table where that could be a possibility that, you know, come Wednesday next week, the Flames could be in a playoff spot. After this game, this is the Flames' 77th game of the season. The Flames now sit two points back from the Winnipeg Jets, who are uh, in the second wildcard spot. The Flames now 77 games played, 36 wins, 26 losses, 15 overtime losses for 87 points. The Jets also have 77 games played, um, and they have 89 points. So you're right. After that, uh, after that game against Chicago, that could be that Winnipeg game could be and probably will be either way the most important game of the season for the Flames. Oh, for sure. And then the turnaround on the game after that, the Flames or the Winnipeg Jets play the Nashville Predators. Uh, so that, um, you know, with Nashville still hanging around, like that'll be a big game for Nashville yeah, too. Yeah, we play them not too far after. Yeah. So it'll be a fun and interesting week for both teams. And, uh, you know, it's setting up some drama and hopefully the Flames... You know, like, it, you know, it, it's unlikely, but they're only three points behind Seattle, although Seattle's schedule is Seattle's ridiculous. Seattle's got two, po- two games in hand, though. Oh, I know, and they play Arizona and Chicago four times, so, yeah, not likely, but, you know, it's still, there. there is only a three-point gap. Doubtful, though. <laughs> Let's just worry about catching Winnipeg before we worry about Seattle. Yeah. Well, so, Matt... Just because uh, Nashville is, you know... We're ahead of Nashville the same as we're behind Seattle. So it's kind of, you know, mirroring either side. Yeah, no, I get it. But let's just let's worry about just overtaking one team before we worry about two. True. Get in before you worry about moving up. Yep. <laughs> you know, the, the I guess the thing I would say over the past four games, um, I think, and really maybe even since the trade deadline, the Calgary Flames' top guys are finally coming through. I think a big thing that we've said all season is the top players have not been the top players for this team. And if we look now, I mean, Tyler DeFoley, 69 points. Elias Lindholm, 63. Nazem Kadri 52. Michael Backlund, 52. Huberto, 51. I mean, is it, you know, is Huberto a far, uh, far cry from last year at over 100 points? Yes. But, you know, those are the top five guys that I would expect to be our top five guys. Yeah, and to be fair to Huberto, the last couple of games, he's looked really good. Uh, he made a number of passes in the game against Anaheim that, if not for bad luck, where the forward ha- had a put- jump over his stick or the defender tied him up at the last second, uh, the Flames could have had a, a number of high-danger opportunities right in front of the net. Which is basically Huberdeau's bread and butter is finding those guys that are like wide open right in front. And well, and, and even in that uh, Vancouver game, that crazy goalie scored right from the blue line or right from the goal line almost, just by knowing who is in front. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's one of those like he's becoming more himself and the, more the guy that I I've seen a lot with the Florida Panthers and. You know, if he can start coming on and you're getting contributions from Toffoli and Lindholm and, 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 like this team all of a sudden is the wrecking ball that we were thinking that this team could be heading Boys, into the season. Boys, hold my beers. I got five games to score 50, 50 points. Yep. Well, that would be one way to guarantee a playoff spot. Just go beast mode 10, you know, break the NHL record each game. You got to have 10 <laughs> points a game to do that. Yep. Yeah, it hit Daryl Sittler's 10 points in the game thing and just do it five times in a row just to punk everybody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and we are still not getting the seasons we need from some guys. You know, Mangiapane, I oh, think, yeah. been disappointing all season, well, 37 to points. Be him, fair to him, though, he also has come on of late, and he's generating a lot more scoring chances, and some of them are actually going in with goals in each of his last two games. So it's one of those, like... like Half the forward group, frankly, has been awful for most of the season, but they're finally getting a little bit of a heater now, which is, like, perfect timing. (laughs) So, you know, you would much rather be heading into the playoffs on a hot streak than, you know, if you can get there, than, you know, how the Flames have been over recent times where, like, the playoff spot's already clinched by now and they're just kind of waiting for 
the end of the season uh, to then try to ramp up their enthusiasm again. Yeah, and I, I guess I just wanted to point that out because I know we've been critical and other people have been critical of the Flames' top people. And again, I'm not saying they're having the best seasons, but like you said, it's finally they're finally starting to figure it out. Yeah, and that's and, the important thing. Yeah, and you know, I mean, we're yes, we're seeing some great um, plays from some of our depth guys. I mean, Walker Dewar now ha- having ten NHL points, um, Jacob Pelte having seven. You know, everyone's pitching in there, and I think that's helping. I mean, even Trevor Lewis, 19 points this year. Um, yeah, you know, well, Setcher's everyone, had a number of points. Richie's had a number of points. And- yeah, I mean, you know, we're and, and you said it earlier when we broke down the Vancouver game. A lot of the points came from the depth guys, but it feels like we're now getting points throughout the lineup. How many times in the past have we talked about times when all the depth guys were doing things in previous iterations of Flames, none of the, the top guys, and then other years when all the top guys were doing things, none of the depth guys. Yeah, and now it seems like everybody's on the same page. And For you, most of the season, nobody was doing anything, and now everyone's on the same page. Yeah, and the only disconcerting thing uh, is the last two games where uh, the goaltenders allowed eight goals uh, against, frankly, some subpar opponents, but... You know, they did get four points, so it's one of those, well, sure, yay. Um, yeah, and even, that even Dylan Dubé at, at 42 points, I think will probably be one of his, if not his career high, one of, because he played a lot of time on that first line this year, which was probably a little over his head. Yeah. I bet 42 is the best he's ever going to get. What's his previous before this? 32. So he's got 10 points extra. But, yeah, you expect that when you're playing on that top line. But, yeah, I mean, you know, Dubé getting 42 points for, you know, $2 million, that's a great value. And I and I think that if we can get all these guys in sync for the last five games, the Flames have a, a chance of doing this. Well, and you look at, like, the Flames, the quality of their opponents. Like, they do play Nashville and Winnipeg and San Jose just like Winnipeg does. They play us, Nashville, and San Jose. But, like, our other two opponents are Vancouver and Chicago, who are both very mediocre. Um, And the other two games that Winnipeg plays are against Minnesota and Colorado, the two best teams in the Central Division. So, you know, like, while it is possible, just like how Winnipeg beat New Jersey today, uh, for them to win those games, Calgary definitely has the advantage uh, with the easier opponents over the last five games. On paper, it's an advantage, Matt, but if you look at the way this team has played against less than desirable teams, the Flames need to keep playing the way they have been. If they play to Chicago or to San Jose, we're not going to like those results. And that yeah. seems to be what happens when crappy teams have come to town. Well, and we've seen that in the Vancouver and Anaheim games mm-hmm. where you know the, they took the first period a little casual, and then, oh, mm-hmm. we're down 2 nothing. That's not good. <laughs> No. And now, oh, we have to try now. <laughs> and, you know, and wait, we we tied it, but the other team actually still exists. Oh, wait, we're losing again. <laughs> and then, you know, eventually they found a way, but, you know, that's definitely not the recipe for success. You need to be able to put these teams away if you want to, you know, like it, their their destiny really is in their own hands. If they beat Winnipeg and they just beat the bad teams, they should make it. And... They just have when we to. looked at this schedule at the beginning of the season, I did not think at all that this these next two weeks were going to be some of those meaningful games this team would have to play. And I would not have pegged that game on April 5th as, you know, the game that the Flames' whole season hinges on. Yeah, and, like, well, even at the beginning of the year, it was basically like, oh, well, the Flames can kind of take April off because, you know, they'll probably have clinched by then and they play a lot of mediocre teams towards the end so who cares type of thing and you can just prep for whoever their first round opponent is and you know it's now it's very thankful that they're playing a bunch of mediocre teams where you know if they do give that they're all they might actually find their way in and you know then it's hit the reset button it's best of seven everybody starts at zero so let's go 
I'm really glad to see this team finally coming together. Like you and I have been trying to figure out what's going on with this team. Why are they the way they are? Why are they not bringing it together? Is there some flaw in the dressing room? And, you know, we had the suspicion at the beginning of the year. It's probably just so much change, but it just seemed like there, there couldn't have been that issue with, you know, as bad as they've been. But, you know, I'm glad to see that when this team really wants to do this and shows us what they can be, that, they actually look like a team that can win some games. Well, they're they're definitely showing that they're the team that we expected them to be if everything was going right. And like where they're a very excellent defensive team. Like they limited both Anaheim and Vancouver to under 25 shots. I think Vancouver only had like 17 shots in their game. And I think Anaheim only had like nine minutes in the offensive zone. Yeah, and like Calgary just steamrolled both of those teams and it didn't show up on the score sheet until the end. But, you know, like they did manage to get 10 goals despite the wonky goaltending. Um, and it's one of those where, you know, with the season coming to down to the line, like, it, you know, you, you're needing the top defense to be playing def- good defense and you need to have contributions from everybody and you need your goaltenders to stop pucks and you know they're they're now getting two out of three and hopefully um you know frankly i'm hoping that vladar starts the chicago game to have marks from re- rested for uh the jets game but you know it's one of those where you know they just need everybody to hit the ground running and let's go um they just need to find a way. And, you know, you you mentioned defense there. Let's talk a little about defense here. The Flames are without Chris Tanev, and usually when they've been without Chris Tanev, they've really not done well at all. Um, and, you know, we've seen, I would say, even though they're limiting other teams' defense, they have been struggling defensively without Tanev. I think that bringing back um, mm-hmm. Michael Stone, I think that what we saw tonight... My, and nothing against Gilbert, who I think's been great in the role he's been asked to be, but much improved over Gilbert. Yeah. Um, Stone, at, at, towards when he got hurt, was struggling a little bit. Where He was. You know, it, it looked kind of like uh, it was the other way where Gilbert was better. Uh, but now that uh, Stone's healthy again, uh, it, Stone clearly was better than Gilbert. And, you know, if we can get you know, performances from Stetcher and Stone uh, that are at the level that they showed in tonight's game moving forward until Tanev is back, like, that allows the top four to play well and not have to worry about, oh, a grenade's gone off, the third pair is out there. And Well, and, I, and remember, and you mentioned it earlier, but for fans listening – Neither of these guys were expected to be in our top six, right? We're missing a big key there in Oliver Shillington. Like, they brought Stone in to be a number seven. So, for all the games he's played this year, you knew he was going to struggle, I think, playing as much hockey as we've asked him to. Gilbert's been a pleasant surprise there, but that's still one of those areas the Flames need to shore up. And I think, you know, if you get Tanev back and you get Stone back and you have Stetcher, it's going to make it tough to pick who should uh, be sitting out every night. Well, and frankly, you would just see Stetcher as the number six because he is the better quality player. I think you're right. It would be it would probably be yeah Tanev Stetcher in the lineup. Yeah, because you'd likely see uh, Weger with Tanev on the second pairing with Hannif and Anderson, and then uh, Stetcher with um, Zadorov. Zadorov. Yeah. Yep. So Matt, after what we've seen now, the first four game win streak this season, uh, Chicago coming up. Has your thought changed from last week? Do you think the Calgary Flames are going to be a playoff team this year? Um, I'm still going to say no because of the fact that they need to actually go out and earn it. And, and they've never, like over the last 10 years plus, well, frankly, go all the way back to 2004, we have not really seen this team earn anything um other than the 14-15 season where uh they did earn the birth to the second round um but 
you know, like this team has really struggled with when the chips are on the line to actually be able to convert and win those important games and then carry on. And, you know, like, yeah, the Flames needed to win four in a row. And they did that, and that's great and wonderful, awesome. But, you know, you still have five games to go, and you're still down by two points, which in effect is three, because there's no way real realistically that the Flames can win the tiebreaker. So, you know, it's one of those where Calgary just needs to find a way to somehow beat Winnipeg and get three points up on them, which... You know, that definitely includes beating the Jets in regulation, but, you know, like, it's a very tall task, and, you know, it's one of those where until they have that X by their name saying they're in, you know, I'm going to say that I don't think they'll make it. I think they're going to give it a run, but, you know, they have to show that they can actually take it. And it, it, at least... I feel the same as you. It's exciting that we have four wins, but... Nothing this season tells me this is the year for the Calgary Flames. And I think, you know, if we're this, if we've been where we are all year, you're not going to solve this in the last two weeks of the season. I still think the Flames are going to fall short. Yeah. Well, realistically, like um, to carry on the point, like there's five games remaining. Realistically, Winnipeg's going to win three of their, theirs more than likely. Which, in order to for the Flames to get past that, like the Flames basically have to win all of the rest of their games. Which could they go on a nine-game winning streak? Sure, anything's possible. But it's kind of one of those where now they're needing to win like nine games in a row in order to make the playoffs. And like while the quality of their opponents is not as good. You know, like, it's a very tall order for this team to overcome all of that. It's possible, it's doable, but, you know, it, come back in a week and, you know, see where the team's at, and then maybe, you know, like, if the Flames are ahead of the Jets heading into the final two games, then it, it's a pretty good chance then. But it's, you know, we're, we're not there yet, and... Calgary needs has more homework they need to do, and frankly, that that patented seven game winning streak that they've had in past years, uh, they pretty much need that right now and to carry on into the, our next episode. They realistically need to carry on and get the next six points too, and then maybe we might be talking playoffs uh, after that. But you know, it, it's still a very tough mountain for this team to climb and you know thankfully they do play the jets on the fifth and they absolutely need to win that one if they don't they, they're done and that's a good way to say it yeah that game is the do or die there you can probably afford to not win chicago if you have to yeah but um, realistically but yeah like if you're coughing up anything you know until you're ahead of the jets you're you're basically every game is a must win. I agree. If the Flames do happen to make the playoffs, realistically, and I know anything can happen, do you see the Flames making it out of the first round? If they are, say they are managed to actually go on this hot winning streak into the postseason, uh, they're likely going to play either Vegas or LA just based on standings and games remaining. Outside chance of Edmonton and an even more remote chance of any of the other teams. But um, I think that they could take Vegas. I think that they'd push L.A. to six or seven um, and be a hard out. But I think that they'd be an out on that. And Edmonton, I think they could beat. Yeah, I don't think they play Edmonton in round one, though. No. Just because Edmonton seems like a... a per perennial paper tiger like honestly i think that regardless of edmonton plays la or vegas in the first round edmonton i do not see winning in the first round like i'd be somewhat no. shocked if they made it to round two i agree and you know not what the flame fan of me wants to say but the i guess the analytical flames watcher says i don't think the flames make it out of the round one if they get there no uh 
Yeah, how would you say? I would be surprised if they did, but uh, I could also see if they did get out of round one, them going on a run. It's just, you know, uh, because it, if they have gotten to the point where they can actually beat a Vegas or an LA, enough is going right for them as a team to be able to do that, that they could then beat whomever the next round and, you know, go all forward. Because, like, they'll have the confidence of, hey, we just upset that team. All the pressure's on them not to lose to us, and let's go. And, you know. And I still wonder... From a a purely, I guess, beneficial standpoint, what is more beneficial for the team this year? Is it to go in and be one and done, or is it to not make the playoffs? Um, if you asked me last week, I would have said that it probably would have been better to miss. But um, with how them how they've shown that they've they actually have a backbone and are pushing forward. I think that it, now it's more beneficial for them if they actually do make it to the postseason, even if they miss out, because, how would you say, most of everything screwed up this year for this team. And secondly, all of these guys are going to be back next year. Um, like, there's no real important free agents to be other than Lucic, which... Again, uh, not really that big a deal. Um, so it, it's one of those where, you know, like them, if they're able to come together and have some success and actually make the postseason, I think it'll erase a lot of the BS from this season uh, because they didn't fall that far on their face and... It's like, okay, well, we'll have another kick at the can next year and, you know, start the season off knowing what we actually need to do to be successful moving forward. And, you know, the good young guys like Dewar and Peltier and Coronado will be more ready to, you know, jump in as fourth line guys and up in the lineup as well. So. And, you know, it's interesting what you said there. I think. If these Flames make the playoffs, I mean, this team is perpetually sort of a first, second round team. That's really, you know, their upside over the last 20 years. Um, well, literally since I, the cup, the Flames have had three guys to win series winning goals. Uh, Matt Stajan in 14-15, Gaudreau last year, and Martin Gelina three times in 04. And that's literally since 1989, our grand total of three guys who have actually scored a series winning goal for Calgary. And I think that in the long run, if the Flames end up making the first round, Flames fans aren't going to remember, you know, the circumstance getting there. It's just going to be, I hate to say it, but almost another year of the Flames disappointing in the playoffs. Well, how would you say? I think it's a little tiny, tiny bit different um, because I think like at most Flames fans realize like this team had basically everything go wrong all year for them. Um, it, like the, literally a four game winning streak is not a big deal for any team. Like even the, the bad teams have had three and four game winning streaks. And yet like this literally is the first time that the flames have strung four together, which for a team that's quasi in a playoff spot, you know, like that's kind of pathetic that it took till game 77 to hit a four in a row. So, like, I think everybody realizes that, like, this team is, like, severely and massively underperformed every part of their abilities. And if they... But can... yet are still managing to keep their head close to the surface. Yeah. So I think that, like, heading into the postseason, if they do get there, that the fans will be applauding their resilience that despite basically everything that could conceivably go wrong for this team going wrong that they still were able to persevere and make it. Um, and then, you know, it also depends on the, their playoff series against whomever they face if they get there. Because, like, if it's like the Anaheim series or the Colorado series from a couple years ago where they just got skunked in the first round and were out in four or five games, like, you know, that's going to leave a bad taste of, like, oh, you guys really do actually suck. And... <laughs> 
For you know, this season, I think you're right. But when we look back at this in 2030, I don't think anyone's going to remember the challenges the Flames had this year. It's just going to be another year of, well, they made it to the first and they were out. Yeah. And I, how do you say, I don't know, like, again, I don't know if this team, if they actually do make it, if they actually will lose in the first round, just because... If they make it, I think, and I wouldn't have said this a week ago, but if they make it, I think they'll have some momentum behind them that they might actually make it out of the first. Yeah. Uh, a that's, week ago, I thought if they snuck in, they'd be four and out. Yeah. Maybe five and out. Yeah. It, how would you say we're both seeing the same thing where like this team is showing that they actually have some backbone to it, and that wasn't really there previous, and... You know, it'll be interesting if they can actually manage to get there. And, you know, that's the homework for the next week and a half for them is, you know, find a way, <laughs> you know. And, I, you know, to me, I mean, yes, we need to celebrate this four-game win streak and it's great and all that, but... You're still down. To, you're still down, and, and to me, nothing tells me that they are going to continue this. No. Like, nothing in my mind says, oh, wow, you know, the Flames are going to keep going with this. Like, it's, it, it's yeah, I, I don't know what to say. Like, it's just one of those things where, you know, yeah, they got four games, but their history this year tells me, and I hate to say this as a Flames fan, that's probably the end of this fun little run. Very well could be. Yeah, you know, like, the Flames could end up losing the next two games and the season's done on April 5th, and, you know, our, we're basically having a... Well, and that happened <laughs> next week, and then getting ready for garbage bag day the following, and, you know, that's that. You know, that very well could happen. We'll see. You know, it's, their destiny is in their hands, and, you know, if they win, it, that's all they gotta do. You know, find a way. And they did the last two games, they found a way to get two points in each. It doesn't matter how you get it, how pretty or awful the games are. If you walk away with two points, that's all that matters. And, you know, we'll see. I, you know, it's entirely up to them. As Daryl says, what impresses me is wins. Yeah. So, Matt, uh, one surprise maybe for this week. Matt Coronado on the roster, wearing number 39, been in practice, has not actually debuted as a flame yet. You and I were pretty sure that he wouldn't have played last week in L.A., but I think we both expect him to be in by now. When are you expecting that we're going to see Coronado? Um, basically, if this week we see that the Flames falter, um, then I think Coronado plays, like, at, for, say they lose against Winnipeg on the 5th. The last three games, Coronado plays all three. And Peltier draws in, and you just, you know tweak the lines accordingly and who cares um if the flames are pressing for that playoff spot um i think that he would probably get in on the san jose game on the very end of the season um and i think that would be the only one he'd play uh and it would be a because we're contractually obligated to play you here's your one opportunity and we're going to shelter you and you're not really going to, you're going to play like five to eight minutes. And you know, the Matthew Phillips and Jacob Peltier debut special where, you know, you're not really playing very much at all. <laughs> yeah. I think right now, I mean, as much as we as flames fans are excited to see him, you know, come in and um, play, I think you've got to leave the lineup the way it is right now. Yeah. Let it rip until you you're done. And yeah, I don't think at this point we can uh, we can. I don't think that we can put him in the lineup because right now I don't know who you take out. And I know a lot of fans are probably screaming at whatever listening to us and saying Lucic guy got a goal tonight. Like I think you've got to run with what's working. Yep. And you know the, this team will get us there or they won't. And you know it, the, as cliche as it is, the answers are in the room. One way or the other. And, you know, the Flames just need to find a way to keep getting two points. And, you know, if they can head into the fifth against Winnipeg Tide, uh, you know, then, hey, you know, it's a jump ball at that point. You know, because if you look after that game, if the Flames do win, 
they'll be up 91 to 89. Uh, we'll have only three games left. The Jets will have four. You know, and it puts all the pressure on Winnipeg because they not only would have to, you know, like they'd have to match us the rest of the way, and their opponents are, you know, Nashville, San Jose, Minnesota, and Colorado, where our last opponents are uh, Nashville, Vancouver, and San Jose. So, you know, like it's not, it's a lot easier for us at that point. So, you know, the... It's going to be tough. Uh, you know, there's not one easy game left on the schedule. They're all do or die. And the Flames need to just find a way to keep getting two points. I love Flames fans, though, and their ingenuity sometimes. I was on the Calgary Flames Twitter, or not Twitter, Reddit this week, and somebody was trying to figure out exactly what it would take to send Coronado down to the AHL, even though he's not eligible, on a conditioning stint. And what classifies as conditioning? And I love the Flames fans just wanting to find a way to get this guy on the ice. Yeah. Um, and it really comes down to the commissioner, and I don't think the commissioner would go for that. So No. Um, as much as we may not like the commissioner, he's not a dummy. He's not going to allow that to happen. Well, Matt, uh, before we move away from the Calgary Flames and uh, talk about some of the last pieces that we have this week. Let's talk a little bit about the Wranglers. The Wranglers have debuted their new mascot, and so far we've had Harvey pulling double duty for both teams. He's got to be tired. He's getting old. Uh, new mascot debuted for the Wranglers. Didn't make a great debut. He came out to center ice, waving a flag. Flag fell off his pole, and he tripped over it. But their new mascot, Blasty the Stallion. He's finally come to life off the jersey. You're more, I think, accepting the Blasty than I am. What do you think? Have you seen the Blasty come to life? Yeah, it's a weird-looking mascot. It looks like he has a bloody nose, which yeah. they tried to get the flame on the nose and didn't do a really good job. And yeah, it's an awful mascot <laughs> to be frank. Um, and I don't know why you're debuting a mascot in the last home game. Like I know they had Kids Day and all that, but why not just debut it next year? Yeah, it, it's kind of hokey a bit. Well, I guess uh, they want him for the playoffs, but yeah, still. But even then, I guess like Harvey's been your guy all year. Bring Harvey to the playoffs. Yeah. I When I heard they were bringing a new mascot, and I've been thinking Scorch the whole time I'm thinking of him because uh, I was expecting they'd bring Scorch back. That was kind of my hope. Yeah, same here. Like that was such a hokey looking mascot that it perfectly fit the AHL theme. Uh, but um, yeah, for some And reason. you know, it's not like they rushed it out. I could see it looking hokey if they rushed it out for the first home game because we didn't have a lot of notice the Wranglers were coming here. You've had all season. Yeah. I know. So, it, but I mean, even if you look at Harvey, there's been evolutions of the Harvey the Hound mascot over the years. Hopefully, they might fix that that head for next year. Yep. We'll see. Um now now that Blasty is the mascot for the Wranglers, do you still think we'll see him used by the Flames? Probably not. I think you, you know, cuz Harvey's tradition, I think you just run with Harvey. But even uh, even on the jersey though, do you think we'll see him used by the Flames? Oh, um well, I think the Flames will keep their third jersey uh, as the Blasty for a bit. They might switch it out for the reverse retro jersey. Uh, from this year, the pedestal, just for something different. But, um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. Because I'm kind of thinking now. I mean, I think that they've, to me anyways, they've put a they've put a line in the sand by having Blasty as the mascot for the AHL team. I have a feeling that you might see Blasty still as a shoulder logo or whatever for the Flames, but I can see Blasty now becoming more of a, a piece for the Wranglers and even having a third jersey next year with Blasty on the front. I think that you probably now separated Blasty out as that common thread between the two in a way, but I think you're going to see more of that artwork used for the Wranglers. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily the front Blasty head, but the sideways Blasty head. I think you'll probably see that that becomes much more prevalent with the Wranglers. And with the NHL getting a new jersey sponsor next year, I haven't heard anything, but last time the Flames changed jersey sponsors, everybody went to two jerseys for a year, no thirds. Yeah. So I could, I could see next year... Flame just going with their home and road and leaving Blasty as an AHL piece. Yeah, I agree. It It's very flexible with everything, though. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that there's enough of a market for 
blasty in some way for this team, but uh, whether that's a shoulder patch or on a new third jersey or... And I think even in that case, though, I'm both teams in Calgary, if you go to the team store wanting a Blasty jersey, I think a lot of people would be fine to buy a Wranglers jersey with Blasty on it. I agree. Well, before we wrap up for this week, I just wanted to give a quick plug here. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a live podcasting session at the Calgary Expo. So if any of our fans are going to be at the Calgary Expo on Saturday, April 29th, uh, I'll be on the podcast stage from 1.15 to 2 in the afternoon doing the podcast starters guide. So I'll be talking about getting started with a podcast if you want to start one. Um, if you're going to be there, please come by, hang out with me for 45 minutes, come say hi. I plan to have some fireside chat stickers and a few other things with me. So if you come say hi, I'll give you something. And if you're thinking about a podcast, maybe you want to do a Wranglers podcast, you want to interview the new uh, Blasty. You, we, I can help you get started, and I can teach you some of the tips that Matt and I have learned over 11 years. This is the button that turns the mic on. <laughs> it's going to be a really long press. I got 45 minutes to fill, Matt. Yep. <laughs> but no, there's going to be more than that. I'm going to be talking about uh, creating a format. I'm going to be talking about um, the gear you need. And one of the things that I've been a proponent of since I, we got started, and that's I think every podcast needs its own website. So I'll, I'll remind everyone again as we get closer, but if you're planning to come out on Saturday the 29th to – uh, the expo, come see me. And if you're interested in podcasting, there's going to be live podcasts and live podcast sessions like this all weekend on the podcast stage. So the information will be out shortly on the expo website, but check it out. And I'd love to see you. Shall we get to predictions, Matt? Yep. Um, biggest week for the flames. Easy to say. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the Winnipeg jets, they only play two games this week against the two teams that are chasing them. Uh, the, what first one on April 5th against the Calgary Flames and then a couple of days later against the Nashville Predators. And the Flames play three this week. They play Tuesday the 4th here in Calgary against Chicago. Then Wednesday, quick trip up to Winnipeg. And then they have two days off and they play Vancouver. So you won last week. I didn't think you would, but you got uh, three wins in a row. So you're now beating me for the first time. Five to three this season is a good season for Matt. Yep. Are you going to go three wins again this week? Uh, I think you got to, you know, it's one of those. I don't think that they'll beat Winnipeg. Um, frankly, I think that will basically, yeah. And then I don't think that they'll beat Vancouver. I think they'll just kind of shut down after that it, realistically. But you think I, once they realize that they, they're they kind of out, they just shut down. Yeah, but I think that um, they will, uh, you know, I'm – Going to go with the three-win prediction, though, because they need six points. Uh, you know, they, they can't really do with much less, so, you know. I had my predictions locked in here before you even said it, and I said I think they'll win Chicago. I think they're going to lose to Winnipeg, and then they're going to lose to Vancouver. Yeah. And just to remind everyone of start times here, Tuesday against Chicago, 7 p.m. at the Dome. Uh, Wednesday against Winnipeg, 5.30 p.m. start time. So make sure you get out of work a little bit early that day. And then, of course, Saturday at eight, is an 8 p.m. start time for Hockey Night in Canada. We're the late game. Yeah. So, Matt, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, we got five games left, right? You, what's, what's the – to me, they've got to win two this week to stay alive. Yeah. Uh, they, Winnipeg and one other. Like, they can't well, lose – it, no, you can't win Chicago and Vancouver. You have to win Winnipeg. Yeah. And I would feel a lot more confident in the Winnipeg game if it wasn't a back-to-back. -back. Yeah, because we saw what uh, Winnipeg just did to Detroit and New Jersey the last couple of games when they were on the second half of a back-to-back. -back and Yeah, 12 goals later, um, not, not so good for Flames fans. So, um, yeah, hopefully Calgary can put the Chicago game away early enough where they can kind of coast and manage the game. Um, and that would be the ideal because the last thing you'd want to do is head to overtime or anything like that or just lose outright. But uh, they need every ounce of gas in the tank uh, for that Winnipeg game. And, you know, it's literally do or die. Do you think that trying to manage your guys for that Winnipeg game do you think that we see Vladar against Chicago? I think you have to. Um, it's not so much uh, you want to. I think you have to. 
Um, just because Markstrom plays better when he has some rest. He looked bad against Vancouver at times, and he looked horrible today. Uh, which that them pulling him after the first period, I think, was due in part to just get him a little bit of time off. I think you have to give um, the Chicago game to Vladar and you know roll the dice and hope that it works. Because yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, like Chicago is legitimately the worst team in the NHL. Uh, they are two points behind um, Anaheim and Columbus. So, you know, uh, it's one of those where, you know, they've lost eight in a row. Um, like, they're they're bad. Uh, so Calgary just needs to find a way to put them away with as little resources used to do so and then, you know, have everything in the tank to throw at the Jets and try to bloody their nose pretty good <laughs> for sure. I think, yeah, I think you've got to go Vladar that game. And I think you've really got to run your or roll your lines um, just to keep your top guys fresh as well. Yeah. And, you know, even defer to the third and fourth lines a bit. Oh, I think once they, if they can get up like two or three up on the jets, I think you're going to start really playing with guys minutes. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And you know, then Nick Ritchie could have most time on ice. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, the Flames say they got out to a three or four uh, goal lead in the third period. You're just seeing like the second, third, and fourth line rolling for most of it. Um, but we'll see. And this team just needs to find a way to beat the Jets on the fifth. Like that literally is their season. That's game seven. And, you know, it's a do or die. And if they don't beat Winnipeg, every other game really is futile. Unless they win all four of the other ones and get some help, but um, that that's not it's not the way to do it. No, because realistically, like uh, if they do uh, win the other four games, they'll finish with ninety five points. Um, in the other four games that Winnipeg, uh, they'd have to lose uh, two in regulation and one in overtime for Calgary if Calgary won out. So. And the key to that Winnipeg game, we can't just win. We've got to win in 60. Yeah, for sure. We can't drop a point to Winnipeg. No. and If they want to drop points to Chicago or Vancouver, fine. Yeah, who cares? Like, literally every other team, who cares? Every other game we're playing, Chicago, Vancouver, San Jose, probably even Nashville, we can afford to drop a point. Yeah, Nashville, now, like, uh, they're two games in hand on both us and Winnipeg. And they're five points back of Winnipeg, and Winnipeg has the tiebreaker on them too. Actually, we have the tiebreaker on them as well. So it it's one of those where um, not really likely that Nashville's going to factor. So frankly, when what Nashville's playing Winnipeg, go Predators, beat them up, please. And when they're not playing Nashville, what is it that the Flames fans are going to be chanting loud on Tuesday? Well, as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.